Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. Uh, my name is Joshua Johnson and I am the Assistant Registrar here at the Figgy. And I'm happy that you could join us tonight. For the time being, we are hosting these virtual programs most Thursdays. For more information on these programs, please check the Figgy's website for information on upcoming events. Just so you know, next week we will be having one of our first in-person events since the pandemic hit, which will be the opening for the celebration for artist Leslie Dill in celebration of her exhibition, Wilderness Light Sizzles Around Me. This event will take place both in person and for a limited audience in person and live via webinar. <laughs> for more information on this program or any of our upcoming events, please check the Figgy's website. We are able to offer these Thursday programs at no cost to you thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, for all that you do, we are so grateful. Thank you. For those of you who are ready to visit the Figgy in person, as I know so many of you are, we are open and recommend that you check out the Figgy's website, which has information on our updated policies before making your visit. For tonight's program, we welcome your questions and comments, so please feel free to type those into the Q&A section at any time, and I will be happy to re relay those. Um, at this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marlene Doubt. Dr. Doubt is a professor and associate director at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies at the University of Virginia where she specializes in pre-20th century Caribbean, African-American, and French colonial literary and historical studies. Tonight, Dr. Dow will take us through her recent article, Why Did Bridgerton Erase Haiti? Thank you for being here tonight, Dr. Dow. Thank you for having me. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you um, in the Zoom audience um, for spending your Thursday evening here um, with us or late afternoon, depending on your time zone. And of course, um, thank you to Joshua Johnson for this kind invitation, um, for having read the article and reached out to me. Um, I'm very excited about this talk today because I get to talk about three of my favorite things, which are historical romances, um, the kingdom of Haiti, and Haitian art. So um, this talk is going to kind of be rich in imagery, and I'll stop and pause um, to reflect a lot of it comes from the figgy, but some of it comes from elsewhere, um, and just kind of what we can learn um, from the Kingdom of Haiti by considering it in its historical context, its artistic and cultural realms as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which is always the moment of truth to see if it works. Um, all right, um, so you should be seeing an image of, um, this is a, a kind of close up of Henri Christophe um, on a commemorative um, Haitian gourd and um, all right, so I wanna first begin by talking about the inspiration for the talk. So why did Bridgerton erase Haiti? Um, it's the title of an article that I published in Avidly, which is a channel of the LA Review of Books on January 19th of this year. And um, if you've spent a lot of time or any time really on social media or just kind of reading articles um, about um, slave revolts and rebellion that appear in popular in the popular public sphere, you'll uh, if you look in the comments or you look on people's Twitter feeds or Facebook comments, people will constantly ask after learning about the Haitian Revolution, whether it's just in an aside or whether there's an entire article devoted to it, they'll say, how come there's never been a film about this? Why is there not a television series about this and it's kind of this constant refrain um, and what is really interesting is that um, in the era of the Harlem Renaissance the Haitian Revolution was constantly portrayed on stage um, by people like Langston Hughes stage to play William Edgar Easton the title roles would be played by famous actors um, like Paul Robeson um, the works project administration had several plays um, that they commissioned about the Haitian Revolution and Haitian revolutionary heroes and um, this middle article that you're looking at was just published a couple days ago um, at JSTOR Daily, and it's about a Russian, a Soviet filmmaker named Sergei Einstein and his attempts to portray the Haitian Revolution on stage. Um, and one of the interesting uh, stories that we get from the article that this one is based off of, which is one by Charles Forrest Dick and Christian Hogsberg, is that when Paul Robeson heard the story of Toussaint and the Haitian Revolution, and then Christophe came into the frame, he was like, I wanna play him. Um, and yet, um, if the Haitian Revolution has not been really on screen um, in sort of these big popular venues um, in the 20th century, the less so for the kingdom of Haiti. 
I also wanted to point out that there's a new book coming out um, next month by Alyssa Goldstein Seppenwall called Slave Revolt on Screen in which she takes us kind of up to the present day um, contemporary attempts to create Haitian revolutionary films that never were, some of which were low budget, bigger budget, um, and, and just talks about some of the complexities that, um, that have led the Haitian revolution to never really have um, been portrayed in sort of a blockbuster Hollywood film. Um, and so when I learned that Netflix was creating a series out of Julia Quinn's Bridgerton novels, and I learned who the actors were, and I hadn't really, Julia Quinn, for those who don't know, is a contemporary novelist, writes historical romance of the Regency period, so under King George III in England. And I wasn't really familiar with her work, so I wasn't aware that there weren't actually black characters or characters of quote unquote mixed race um, in her novels. And so as I started to watch the series, I found myself a little bit puzzled because there's all of the this interactions between white and black characters. And while there were some black people in Regency England, um, there were not the amount that were portrayed um, in the in the series or in the roles. Um, and, and as it sort of got folded back the story, we find that it's a sort of marriage of color neutral casting with also a kind of uh, storyline and arc that wipes away the necessity of kind of talking about race. So um, King George has married Queen Charlotte, who is in real life reputed to have had some very distant African ancestry, the 12th and 13th century, so medieval period, um, and that this has created this kind of egalitarian society. And so I just thought, wow, what a missed opportunity. And so many of us were discussing this. So I penned this article and I'm just um, going to read you the last two paragraphs, which set the basis for the talk today. As I indulge in the spectacle of Bridgerton myself, I couldn't stop thinking about what Hollywood still refuses to show us. A luxurious 19th century black kingdom created by and for black people. And I fear that Bridgerton, by having taken up precious industry space with a fantasy of black aristocracy in England, might in the end make it harder to produce a series about real life black aristocracy in the Caribbean. It's too bad because we really could have it all. The kingdom of Haiti had what everybody likes about aristocratic period dramas, love, loss, and betrayal, along with tons of bling, but with actual historical depth and ample material for cultural and political reflection. So today I'm going to be talking about the kingdom of Haiti, uh, but before I do so, I wanna point out that when I say sort of 19th century has all of the things that we would want in such a period drama, that the kingdom of Haiti is one of the Haiti's monarchies of the 19th century. We also had an empire under the emperor Jacques I preceding that. Um, and then later in the mid 19th century, the emperor Faustin Sulouk I um, will also reign over an, a short lived empire. So there's just so much here to this story. And the part that I really wanna press on is the historical depth that is involved in understanding the kingdom of Haiti and the ample material for cultural and political reflection. Because of course, when movies and films come to Hollywood, they're designed to be entertaining, but there are also things that we can learn um, from, from engaging with the history and culture of the kingdom of Haiti. Um, and there are also political questions that we can ask um, that we might not be able to answer them, but we can at least sort of engage them. And so that's what I would like to do today using Haitian artwork, contemporary, um, also from the 19th century and talking about objects um, and ideas that were produced within the kingdom of Haiti. So I'm gonna jump right into the story and then I'll step back and um, kind of do a little bit of an overview of the Haitian revolution um, because one of the things about the kingdom of Haiti is we can't really necessarily understand it without the Haitian revolution. So it's really an opportunity to tell a very full and rich story um, and one that we don't often find um, displayed on screen. So the royal couple of Haiti rode into their coronation on June 2nd, 1811 to thunderous shouts of Viva Henri, Viva la Famille Royale. They were on a carriage pulled by eight horses. After receiving his diamond crusted crown and scepter, the new king, Henri Christophe, ascended an ornate throne shrouded under a canopy of crimson silk embroidered in gold and trimmed with gold fringes. It was sprinkled with stars and a gold phoenix, which would be very important uh, to his kingdom. The throne itself was perched on a platform that reportedly towered almost, uh, almost 20 meters in the air. But little did the cheering onlookers know that the first king of Haiti would also be its last. 
So Henri Christophe's early life was in some ways, um, you know, doesn't really foretell his extraordinary rise. So he's born on the island of Granada, which is going to end up being a British claimed island um, on October 6, 1767. And I have some of the documents um, produced in the Kingdom of Haiti that give us an indication of who Christophe was. Um, so um, one of his erstwhile biographers lets us know that he's from the island of Granada. Here we learn his birthday in the Almanac Royal. Um, and then in this very important footnote in the writings of Ferdinand de Batte, one of the most important writers in the kingdom, um, we learned that he, Christophe did, served um, in the war in the United States, uh, the Revolutionary War, and that he was wounded at the Battle of Savannah. Um, I recently had the opportunity to visit the monument to the Chasseur Volontaire, which is what the sort of re colored regiment, as it was called, um, that their French name was the Chasseur Volontaire, and they were people of color from the colonies and in the particularly from the colony of Saint-Domingue, present day Haiti. So Christophe ends up in this group um, fighting, even though he is only 12 years old, he receives a bullet wound to the leg we've learned, and um, he's depicted at the monument as a drummer boy. Um, the monument is really, really interesting. And if you ever go to Savannah, um, it, it kind of stands out because most of the other monuments, and it's a city that's filled with monuments, almost every little square has a statue of a general from the American Revolutionary War or for some significant soldier. And so this one depicting these chasseurs volontaires um, is the only one from the American Revolutionary period that has people of color. Uh, uh, depicted on it. And um, I was very interested in sort of all of the different inscriptions. And so I took pictures of all of those. Um, and especially this one tells us that Christoph was sort of in very good company um, in terms of people who would play an enormously important role in the trajectory of these at the time French colonies. Um, we have, for example, uh, Louis Jacques Beauvais, who will become a very illustrious general in the Haitian Revolution. Jean Baptiste Mars Belay, of course, will be very important in the National Convention where France is going to eventually abolish slavery in all their territories in 1794. We have Martial Bess. Uh, we also have Pierre Faubert, who's the father of the 19th century Haitian playwright of the same name. Um, and we have André Rigaud, who is the noted uh, rival of Toussaint Louverture. And so um, uh, this is going to be, uh, the, is there some coincidence between the fact that um, all of these figures fought in the American Revolutionary War and then went on to become these generals of the Haitian Revolution? Um, well, many historians and scholars and writers have written about this exactly in that manner, that this had seasoned them um, for the rebellion and the revolution of their lives. So this prolonged siege is only going to be Christophe's first encounter with such a revolution. Um, there are a few surviving written records about his life immediately after the American Revolutionary War. So this battle, which took place on October 9th, 1779, which incidentally the, the fighters lose, although of course we know that the Americans uh, colonists will end up being victorious. Um, and so we have questions. Um, did Christophe gain his freedom? Um, for example, like some of the other black soldiers who fought in the war, or was he forced to continue to live with enslaved status? How and why did he make his way from the mainland of North America back to the Caribbean and eventually to the colony of Saint-Domingue. What we do know is that for over the next decade, he worked as a mason and a waiter at a hotel in Saint-Domingue. And in 1791, when the colony's enslaved population rose up in rebellion, uh, after this, he's going to get another opportunity to fight for freedom. Uh, so now we need another character to enter our cask cast, um, led by a formerly enslaved man named Toussaint Louverture. Uh, these rebels fought against plantation owners, as well as British and Spanish forces seeking control of the island. Christophe quickly rise through the ranks. We find him holding important posts um, pretty early on in the revolution, um, especially by the mid 1790s and proving himself the equal of more experienced generals. Um, and of course, our main character for this part is Toussaint Louverture. And you're looking at a famous um, watercolor painting of him that was uh, based on an engraving, an earlier engraving, and then um, one painting from the uh, Figgy collection, the uh, masterworks of Haitian art um, that were recently on display there. And um, this is going to be important in a moment with another piece of iconography from the same collection. Um, but I do want to point out here the, this very brightly colored horse that we have um, in the image. 
Well, as I mentioned, Kristoff is quickly rising to the ranks. And um, in 1802, we find him as commander over the city of Cap Francais, which is the principal city of the colony. And this is important because Napoleon Bonaparte has already risen to power in France. He's changed the French constitution to say that there can be different laws in the colonies from those that reign in France. And this is opening the door for the reinstatement of slavery. So when he sends Napoleon, his brother-in-law, Charles Victor Emmanuel Leclerc, in what's called the Leclerc expedition uh, to Saint-Domingue to quote unquote, destroy the government of the Blacks, by which he meant that government led by Toussaint Louverture at that time. Um, the first person he's going to have to contend with is Christophe, because Christophe is commander over the city, and Leclerc needs to make sure Christophe is not going to fire on them. So he sends him a letter saying, let us dock, and Christophe has a very acerbic um, and assertive response. He says, I can't let you do this. I have been given my authority by Toussaint Louverture, who is not here at the moment, being on the eastern side of the island in Santo Domingo. So I can't let you uh, dock here. And if you do, I will reduce this city uh, to ashes. And so you're looking at a 19th century engraving here. Um, and the words on the bottom in French are saying that he's basically the torture, the incendiaire of the city of Cap, because of course, that is exactly what Christophe will do. Um, in February 1802, he evacuates the city of women and children um, and uh, tells the soldiers to set fire. Uh, they do. And when, according to Isaac Louverture, who's Toussaint Louverture's son, uh, when his father is riding back in from the eastern side of the island, all he sees are ashes and smoke and people fleeing uh, this, uh, this fire. Um, now, of course, this isn't going to sit well with Leclerc, who blames Toussaint Louverture and Christophe and puts them hors la loi, outlaws of France, um, issues a decree to that effect, um, saying that every citizen is ordered to treat them as rebels of the French Republic. And so this beaded flag, which also comes from the Figgy collection, um, is made by Murland Constant, who is really a master at this genre. These flags, I mean, the picture can't do it justice that I have here, um, but it's so very intricate. And you will see that it is the opposite image, the one by Edouard Duval Carrier. So you see, if you look, I'll go back to the flag in a second, um, you have uh, all of the same, you have some shells there, you've got him uh, in the blue suit, you see his posture is the same, and of course this very brightly um, colored horse. Well, things uh, don't end up, uh, things sort of start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, Christophe is engaged in a back and forth with Leclerc, and Leclerc is promising to him that the goal of this expedition is actually not to bring back slavery, but rather to establish Leclerc as the commander general um, over the colony to get to, to saint Louverture um, to acknowledge the authority of Leclerc. And in mid-April, um, we find that Christophe does uh, agree to defect to the side of the French um, so he can keep his rank as a general. And uh, Leclerc sends a very interesting um, letter to the Minister of the Marine back in France, which ends up being published in Le Moniteur Universel, which is the official newspaper um, under Bonaparte and had lots of propaganda in it. And, and in, I won't read this, but uh, Leclerc basically paints Christophe as this sort of obsequious, fawning man who just loves France, um, which is going to be very interesting because uh, look. Christophe's kingdom will be characterized by its ardent hatred for France. And um, this has to do with many things. One of those things is that despite the promises of Leclerc that slavery would not be returned, what happens in May of 1802 is that we get the return of slavery um, at uh, in the colony of Martinique, which has recently been returned officially to French hands at the Treaty of Amiens. Um, and in July of that same year, um, slavery will be officially reestablished by a subsequent edict on the island of Guadeloupe, where just as in Saint-Domingue, it had been abolished since 1794. Um, and uh, and so this is going. This is one thing that is going to encourage Christophe and Dessalines, who has by this time al also defected to the French army, uh, to rejoin the side of the independent army, the army um, that does not. And by that I mean the army that does not want to be affiliated with France. Not necessarily that they're striving for independence just yet, 
But um, one of the things that will help them change their motto is that in June of 1802, Toussaint Louverture um, has been arrested. He's been deported. He's sent to France. He arrives there in August of 1802, where he is imprisoned without a trial. He never gets to give an official testimony other than these memoirs that he writes while he's on his deathbed. And one of the reasons he's on his deathbed is that the French have essentially been starving him. He's uh, dehydrated. He catches pneumonia. He's constantly cold and feverish. He suffers a stroke. No one helps him. There are lots of images that were painted of this moment um, in the early 20th century in Haiti. Um, also in the 19th century, one of the most famous of the images is by a man named John Relly Beard from 1853, who wrote a biography of Louverture. But the one I'm showing you here on screen um, is from Vandenesse Ducasse's uh, Toussaint au Four du Joux. Four du Joux is the name of the prison, the fortress where Toussaint Louverture um, was held captive. And um, this one captures much more sort of a reality that I find more striking because in so many of the other images, there are people with Toussaint Louverture when he died. Um, and we know that when he died, he was alone. And in fact, he may have died before uh, we get the official autopsy because um, the person who records it notes that no one had checked on Louverture for a few days. Um, and so this sort of, to me, captures the sorrow um, involved in the last moments of Toussaint Louverture as play um, states in its subtitle. These events coupled with the reestablishment of slavery, the allowing of slavery in the French colonies um, are only going to encourage the Haitian revolutionaries to change their motto from liberty or death to independence or death. Um, at the Battle of Vertières, which takes place on November 18th, 1803, the Haitian revolutionaries are finally going to succeed in driving the French out of Cap Francais. Um, Rochambeau, who seconded Leclerc, is going to be forced to capitulate, um, to surrender, and the Haitian revolutionaries are are going to declare independence officially on January 1st, 1804. Um, Unfortunately, Toussaint Louverture will not live to see this, but um, General Jean-Jacques Dessalines will soon rise to the rank of emperor. He will accept his nomination as emperor. Um, he will appoint Christophe as the general over the whole Haitian army. And um, Alexandre Pétion, a new character to enter our frame, um, will be given command um, over the southern portion um, of uh, now independent Haiti. Um, and uh, unfortunately for Dessalines, his reign will not last. And one of the things that I find really interesting about 20th century Haitian art is how so many discrete moments, big moments, small moments, um, I, I will show you some of those in just a moment, are painted. So you get everything from to Saint Duverture being arrested in, in Haitian paintings to this very momentous um, depiction of Dessalines um, being assassinated on his horse at Pont Rouge, which occurred on October 17th, um, 1806. And so that's what this painting is depicting. So it's very tumultuous years after the revolution um, that will eventually um, lead Christophe to become president and generalissimo of the forces in the earth of the earth and seas over northern Haiti. Um, if I go back a slide, Petion, on the other hand, is going to make himself president of a separate republic in the south of Haiti. Um, and this, the drama about this has everything to do with the assassination of Dessalines and how Christophe will eventually become a king um, in a world of kings, but a king nonetheless over northern Haiti. And so the dividing line between these two separate um, states essentially uh, is about here in Saint-Marc, which Saint-Marc was uh, considered to be a city um, in the North. Establishing sovereignty after slavery um, was complicated on both sides of the island. Petion's Republic was modeled in theory after that of the United States as sort of this inspiration. Um, but actually, when we look at the way that it's politically organized, we see it actually much more resembles the French Republic, how it had sort of set itself up initially um, as having electors who would sort of cast their vote for a region. So you had all of these senators um, in the Republic and they would cast their vote. So you didn't have a popular vote. 
Um, as for the northern side, eventually in 1811, Christoph is going to set up a constitutional uh, but hereditary monarchy, once again, uh, making himself a king in a world of kings. Um, and so this may seem strange now, but of course, at the time, monarchies were the most common and accepted form of governance in the world. Um, indeed, one writer from the kingdom justified the establishment of the monarchy by noting one finds this institution in all the most free people, the most civilized, and the most enlightened on earth. Um, nonetheless, Haiti's first and only kingdom immediately attracted the attention of media outlets from around the world. Many US and British newspapers and magazines ran celebrity profiles of the Haitian king. One newspaper described him as, quote unquote, the elegant model of an Hercules. Another described him as a remarkably handsome, well-built man with a broad chest, square shoulders, and an appearance of great muscular strength and activity. According to onlookers, uh, Christophe was uncommonly tall, which I think this portrait by Richard Evans, a British artist who lived for a time in the kingdom, kind of really captures quite well the stature um, and the poise of Christophe. And uh, this engraving here is one that circulated all around the Atlantic world. And you really see the sort of op come through um, in the robes that he's wearing, um, in his posture, in the boots. Um, if you can see it well on your screen, you can see all of these etchings. And what was fascinating to me about this is that um, Edouard Duval Carrier uh, was inspired not only by this painting, but also by uh, Leo Carpentier's In the Kingdom of This World, um, which is a novel, a mid 20th century novel that Carpentier wrote about the Haitian Revolution that a significant portion takes us to the kingdom of Christophe. And so we see here, if you look at the two, the engraving and you look at the, actually it's not a painting, it's an engraving on plexiglass here as well. Um, you can see that he really kind of brings to the fore so many of the original elements of the engraving and has changed the sort of onlookers, which is one of the things that Edouard Duval Carrier is so good at doing is taking um, kind of existing portraits from the era and adding elements that really stop and make you pause to, to um, to perform an analysis. Um, and, and here, this is where the Danse Taino, of course, the indigenous population of the island um, in the pre-Columbus era um, is also there. So other articles about the kingdom of Haiti. So there were those that just talked about who Christophe was, but there were also people who had some questions. One writer of the era asked how there could be a republic on one side of the island and a monarchy on the other. I would like to note, however, there are actually three forms of governance on the island. Uh, there's a republic in the south. Um, there's, of course, the kingdom in the north. And then there's a colony uh, on the eastern side of the island um, because, oops, sorry. Um, uh, because uh, France was still on the eastern side of the island after Haitian independence until 1809 with the Reconquista of Santo Domingo, when Spain would take over until 1822. And after that, the island would be for a 20 year period about um, reunified. So it's sort of a politically uh, tumultuous era um, that, uh, that Christophe is reigning over and this sort of smaller portion of a much larger island. Others said, is this black king trying to mimic the same white sovereigns who had once enslaved his people? Well, there were still those who lauded the kingdom. Um, so despite having created a monarchy in a world of other monarchies, the way in which Christophian society was politically organized remained an object of study in the Atlantic world. So similar to with Pétion saying, oh, our inspiration is the United States, Christophe talked about British monarchy. But actually, if you look at the structures of the way the nobility um, was sort of codified and what they were in charge of, it much more closely resembled French monarchy. So there's an interesting marriage of those two things, um, but also with some creolization, for example, outlawing of slavery and colonialism, um, which did not exist under the French monarchy or in the British monarchy. Um, Christophe's first constitution of 1807 to that end had been translated into Spanish um, by Juan Lopez Cancelada, who was known at the time for this um, translation of a biography <laughs> entre guillemets, or in quotation marks, I'll, we'll say it like that, of Jean-Jacques Dessalines that had appeared in 1804 by Louis Dubroca. Um, the edicts establishing the royal order of Haiti were also immediately translated into English and printed in Philadelphia in 1811. So just sort of continuing to think about the interest of this world. Um, and later, the famous British naturalist Joseph Banks publicly championed Henry's new policies, which had been published in an 1812 book of laws titled The Code Henri. So again, an interesting creolization there because you've, we've had the Code uh, Noir under Louis the 
uh, 14th, and then of course reigning over colonies for all that period, um, we're going to get the code Napoleon, and here we have the code Henri. Banks also called this book of laws the most moral association of men in existence, and he noted that nothing that white men have been able to arrange is equal to it. Banks admired the Code Henri's detailed reorganization of the economy from one based on slave labor to one at least in theory based on free labor. And this transformation was something the world had not yet seen. How do you go from slave labor to free labor? And thus in many respects, it was wholly fitting for the formerly enslaved man turned king whose motto was, I am reborn from my ashes. And so what you're looking at here is um, a facsimile of the um, armorial of Henri Christophe um, here, if you can see this on your screen, it says, Je renais de mes cendres, I'm reborn from my ashes. And on the bottom, it says, God, my cause, and my sword. Um, this insignia was printed atop the official newspaper of Haiti, the Gazette Royale d'Haïti. Um, and this is a, a commemorative coin issued by UNESCO um, at the, on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of Haitian independence. So what was really unique about Haiti's labor codes is that they provided for shared compensation between proprietors and laborers at a full fourth the gross product free from all duties and also contained the provisions for redistributing the land that had previously belonged to landholding enslavers. Your majesty and his paternal solicitude, one edict reads, wants for every Haitian, indiscriminately the poor as well as the rich, to have the ability to become the owner of the land of our former oppressors. Uh, Henry stated paternal solicitude even extended to enslaved Africans. While the Constitution of 1807 had announced that Haiti would not disturb the regime of the colonial powers, Royal Haitian Guards regularly intervened in the slave trade to free captives on foreign ships that entered Haitian waters. An October 1817 issue of the Royal Gazette of Haiti celebrated Haiti's uh, military capture, uh, the Haitian military's capture of uh, a slave ship and subsequent release of 145, quote, of our unfortunate brothers, victims of greed and the odious traffic in human flesh. Henry's instructions were to divert these Portuguese slavers, and this was not just a one-off. Um, even before he became king, the government was celebrating its victories against Portuguese empire. The January 3rd, 1811 issue of the official government newspaper casually mentioned an anecdote about two little children who had been recently liberated from a Portuguese slave ship. The article says that during a formal parade celebrating the anniversary of Haitian independence, the children recognized the language and dancing of some of their countrymen who subsequently called them over to kiss and embrace them. It seemed as though the children saw in them the parents from whom they had been stolen, the article reads. Oh, fatherland, how touching is your memory. This was not the only way that the kingdom combated slavery. Combating slavery was a material effort and it was a discursive effort, but it was also political. The kingdom's very existence struck fear in the hearts of colonial governments across the Caribbean. And the official historian of the kingdom, Baron de Vate, published many anti-slavery uh, pamphlets and colonial tracts out of the official government press. And one of these caused quite an international stir. But before I tell you about that, I want to focus on this painting, which I just love. Um, it's in, unfortunately, only in black and white in my book on, on, um, on uh, Baron de Vate, which is called Baron de Vate and the Origins of Black Atlantic Humanism. Um, but there are no likenesses of Vate that we know about. We have some of some of his white ancestors back in Normandy. His father was a white Frenchman from Normandy. His mother was a free woman of color in colonial Saint-Domingue, the daughter of a very rich planter. And yet he will find himself, himself fighting on behalf of the army indigène um, under Dessalines, um, previous to that under Toussaint Louverture, and then will find himself as being one of the principal, most important writers um, in the kingdom of Haiti. And this painting is very interesting, first, because I'm not sure which of these uh, individuals is supposed to be actually um, uh, the Baron de Vate. Um, the second thing is that his name is in the title of the painting. And then um, this is really a depiction of the flag that um, Dessalines had adopted, except on this one it says Henri Christophe, if you can see that Le Roi du Royaume du Nord. So I find it just a fascinating painting on kind of multiple levels for the different, the marrying of, the marrying of different moments um, um, in the painting. 
Um, so back to this pamphlet that's causing quite an international stir. So this is the story of a man from Kingston, a white British man named Thomas Strafford, who lives in the kingdom of Haiti for a time um, in 1816 and then decides to go back to Kingston. And he takes with him one of Vate's most spirited pamphlets called Reflections on a Letter from Mazer. And Mazer was a French colonist that Vate was writing back to to refute his kind of spirit pseudoscientific theories. Well, when Strafford returns back, He's arrested for having these pamphlets on him. He's charged with having unlawfully quit Haiti. Uh, they say that he's planning to foment sedition and slave rebellion in Kingston, Jamaica. And he goes before the court of Middlesex disease and he is convicted eventually um, of having produced several wicked, scandalous, malicious seditions and inflammatory libels um, on behalf of Christophe. Um, and what is really interesting is that the indictment, um, it's sort of on this role in the Jamaican National Archives with lots of other indictments that are all very short, that just state the crime. Well, Stratford's indictment is 38 pages long because it contains huge trunks in the French original language from Vate's pamphlet and then an English translation. And so this ends up being actually the first English translation of of uh, Vate's reflections on, the, um, the, on this letter from Mazer. Um, later, an official English translation will be published in England and London in 1817 by a British botanist who had also spent a lot of time in independent Haiti named William Hamilton. That's what these initials stand for. Um, and what was so threatening about this pamphlet when I actually sort of delve into the passages that are being translated as evidence of sedition, many of them are statements of black humanity. Um, so we get Vate saying, I have been tempted 20 times to throw away my pen. I feel humiliated, I am a man. I feel it to be so in all of my being. I possess all of the faculties. I have thought, reason, strength. I have every sense of my sublime existence. And I find myself obliged to refute puerile arguments, absurd sophisms, just to prove to men like me that I am their equal. Um, and what you're looking at here is a photograph of Baron de Vate's um, coat of arms from the Armorial of Haiti, which is housed at the Royal College of Arms um, in London. And so his devise was sincerity and frankness, franchise. Um, all right, so um, to finish with Strafford, I mentioned that he was convicted, but he was convicted, and I, you won't be able to read this, so I'll just tell you what they say, um, of having no wrongdoing, no wrongdoing intent, um, evil intent, because he blamed it on his Haitian housekeeper and said, oh, she must have stuck these documents in there and I don't know how they got there and I don't have anything to do with the King of Haiti. And so I just have here um, a, a, a snippet from one of the newspapers from August 24th, 1816 in Haiti that clearly shows Thomas Strafford there having dinner um, at the palace. So, and this is just one of many occasions that he was there. So it was, it's interesting. This was his defense and it worked to a certain extent, but he was still found, uh, he was convicted, had to pay the fine and stay in jail for a while. Um, they just said, you didn't have any malicious intent. All right, so I want to return to some of the more cultural elements which involve economics. Um, so what was, um, you know, Christophe kind of doing with the wealth and how did he get this wealth that allows him to produce this massive citadel that you are looking at there? Um, so he, um, he said that he built the citadel in case the French tried to invade again, but to accomplish all of this, of course, he needed not just money, but a workforce. He therefore institutes mandatory labor. So Christophe would issue edicts that required, for example, and this is a quote, all the idle people found in the towns and villages to be sent to the countryside to engage in the work of agriculture. Um, so the idea here that he would write about over and over again, and this goes with that sort of paternalistic solicitude that he liked to, to say, which is one of the things he liked to say in his letters as well, um, was that no one could be idle or lazy. They had to be contributed to the state and that if they contributed to the state, they would get benefits from the state. Um, and so this labor system was called affirmage and it had roots um, in the post-emancipation period of the colony um, under saint Onax and eventually under toussaint Louverture and Dessalines as well. Christophe also issued edicts requiring that the farmers begin planting in addition to coffee, sugar, indigo, and cotton, which were the kingdom's mainstays, wheat and other grains, potatoes, and other vital means of subsistence. Christophe said that the only way for Haitians to remain truly free was for them to not be beholden to foreign nations for everyday goods. 
to me, this means, you know, I always think that Kristoff had this very keen, perhaps prescient understanding of what food dependency um, would mean for Haiti. He sort of kept saying we can't be dependent on foreign nations for things that we need to live every single day. The 19th century Haitian historian Thomas Madou, nevertheless, says that the labor on these farms was forced, as in it was not compensated. It's very clear, however, that very few people, if anyone in the era, likened this labor system to slavery itself. Only much later um, did people say this, um, but it was certainly a feudal system of some type. And I want to read you now the oath that King Henry took at his coronation in June 1811. He said, I swear to maintain the integrity of our land and the independence of the kingdom, to never allow under any pretext the return of slavery, nor of any feudal system contrary to liberty and the exercise of the civil and political rights of the people of Haiti. Um, so the question that I have is, was this feudal system contrary to liberty and the exercise of the civil and political rights of the people of Haiti? And so in the project that I'm working on now, that's one of the elements um, that I'm unfolding is what was this labor system really like? Well, how did it affect the everyday people uh, living in the kingdom of Haiti at the time? Okay, so what is the kingdom doing with all this wealth generated from the imports uh, and or the exports rather and the taxes? Well, buying lots of carriages, which we see here reflected in the um, this 1960 painting by Senec Aubin, um, but also um, having opulent parties and building a magnificent palace. Um, during his reign, Christophe lived in an elegant palace called Sans Souci, meaning without worry, uh, along with his wife, Marie-Louise Croix-David, who's not pictured in this painting, and their three remaining children, the princesses Amethyst and Athanaïr, and the prince, the heir apparent, um, Victor Henri. Um, this painting has a really interesting history. It was put up for auction um, and purchased by the um, Haitian Embassy of Washington, D.C., and it was in the foyer on display there for a while um, before it was repatriated in October of last year on the occasion of the commemoration of the bicentennial of the end of the Christophe era, the Kingdom of Haiti. It was repatriated and is now housed um, in Mupana in Port-au-Prince, and I always wonder, I wonder what Christophe would have thought about that since he called Port-au-Prince um, port au crime which means Port of Crimes, because that is, of course, the seat of the government of his rival, Alexandre Pétion, and then of his other rival, uh, Jean-Pierre Boyer, after the death of Pétion in 1818. So in 1813, however, the construction of the opulent Sanssouci Palace was completed. Um, the palace was partially destroyed by an earthquake in 1842. So this is it as of 2020. Um, and today its remains have been designated a World Heritage UNESCO site along with the citadel that you saw earlier. During its heyday, the palace dazzled, and we can see that from engravings and paintings, watercolors from the era. Um, there were the elegantly manicured gardens. There was a unique domed cathedral, which unfortunately um, caught fire um, in February of uh, 2020 or March of 2020. It had a thatched domed roof that had recently been repaired, um, but I understand that repairs are underway again. Um, the structure was flanked by a dramatic double staircase, which I think you can really see even in uh, the remains, the ruins of the palace. Um, and uh, it also had two arches detailed with etchings and inscriptions. One acknowledged Henry rather than Jean-Jacques as the country's founder. There were uh, also two painted crowns on the principal palace facade, each of which stood at 16 feet tall. The one on the right read uh, to the first monarch crowned in the new world. The one on the left said, the beloved queen reigns forever over our hearts. So newspapers around the world reprinted articles from the monarchy's official newspaper, the Gazette Royale d'Haïti, detailing the royal family's lavish dinners, uh, replete with bombastic speeches and lengthy toasts to famous contemporary figures such as King George III of England, the US President James Madison, the King of Prussia, and the friend of humanity, the immortal British abolitionist Thomas Clarkson, um, who was actually a frequent correspondent of the king along with the British abolitionist William Wilberforce. The Gazette also recounted the decadence of Queen Marie-Louise's August 1816 official birthday celebration, which lasted for 12 days and had 1,500 people in attendance. On the final day of the party, 12 cannons fired after the Duke of Oz toasted the queen as the perfect model of mothers and wives. So this is a bust outside of the palace that has caused a lot of 
speculation over the years. Some say that it's Marie-Louise Croix David. Um, some say that it's an actress. Uh, Christophe was a huge fan of the theater. The court put on lots and lots of plays and operas. Um, and we see here this mask, like a theater mask in the middle of her dress. Um, and some say, audaciously, I think, that it's Pauline Bonaparte, wife of General Leclerc. Um, I would say maybe more on the actress side, and some others have said perhaps it's one of Christophe's many mistresses, um, but I, I don't know that the queen would suffer that to be in her presence, so uh, the jury remains out on, uh, on who this bust is actually supposed to be depicting. Well, I have to bring us to the end of the story of the kingdom of Christophe. Um, so, Christophe in August of 1820 is going to suffer a stroke at a church in Limonade and this is going to debilitate him for a while and um, it also kind of weakens his authority and, and allows his opponent which who is now Jean-Pierre Boyer as I mentioned um, he succeeded Pétion as president of the republic um, it's going to allow his opponent to gain some strength to recover some strongholds that had once been um, at least not threatening for example Gaumont uh, in Grand Anse region, region um, and to try to strike on Saint-Marc, that kind of bordering city. Um, and so on October 8th, 1820, two days after his birthday, Christophe does take his own life um, by shooting himself in the heart. And this is after the defection of many key members of his military. This painting to me, which is also in the Figgy collection, has always been very interesting. It's called The Last Days of King Christophe. What's interesting to me is that Christophe had actually rallied in September of that year. So he was no longer bedridden. Um, and yet in this painting, we see he's surrounded by you know, generals and they're kind of pointing and maybe conspiring against him. He's got his doctor there. Um, the doctor's black, but in reality, his doctor was a Scottish doctor named Duncan Stewart, who was white. Um, the queen is there and we see at least one of his daughters and maybe his son, I think, in the and, and onlookers out at the windows and in the hall. Um, when Christophe commits suicide, he is recordedly by himself also. Um, there are some other depictions of him with other people when he does it with the gun. Um, that, is, that is an interesting um, portrayal. So I always say I can never really leave it at Christophe's suicide because what happens in the years after that are really important for why I think this story isn't just about entertainment value. It's also not just about um, the history, which is important all on its own. Um, there's also this, and, and the cultural elements as well, but there's also a, a supremely political element to why I think this story needs to be more broadly known. And the reason for this is that after Christophe's suicide, President Jean-Pierre Boyer is going to reunite the North and the South very quickly along with the East in 1822. And now the island is all the Republic of Haiti. And after he does that, he very quickly starts trying to get official recognition of the island as uh, independence from France because under the Bourbon restoration, the uh, both times the French Kings have been trying to retake the island Island and send spies and try to force um, them, Haiti to become a protectorate of France um, and try to force some kind of dependent status on the island. And while Petion had been open to it, Christophe always wrote back that it was inadmissible, they would not pay any indemnity. Well, Jean-Pierre Boyer does agree to the April 20, 1825 indemnity. He signs it in July 1825. And what this means is that the Haitian government agrees to pay 150 million francs in 1825 money um, to the French government as the price of recognition. This bankrupts the country. Um, the, the entire 19th century, all the projects of Christophe have to stop the schools that he'd instituted for boys and girls, the projects of roads, the projects of building, the projects of you know creating and strengthening the army. The Haitian people uh, will not uh, finish paying off these draconian taxes and fees, forced to take out all these loans until the 1890s, um, and then the tariffs not until 1947. And so this is widely acknowledged to have bankrupted the country. Also, if you look at the iconography from the era, the French then start to paint themselves as the true liberators of Haiti, the true founders of Haitian independence. Um, and in this one, we see, you know, Boyer, uh, the, the Baron de Akao, who comes to Haiti with the decree uh, to give it to Boyer. Um, and everyone is sort of hailing the French and clapping for them. And in this one is even worse, you know, we see an, uh, supposed to be an enslaved African in chains being anointed by King Charles X, who's the French king 
um, who forces this decree. Um, and so when I, when I think about King Henry's legacy, I always think about what Baron de Vate said um, as a response to the idea that Haiti would ever pay an indemnity, that Haiti ever owed anything to France. He said, it is the recognition of our independence that will forever protect us from the tyranny of our oppressors. Without this precondition, no treaty, no agreement. We want to be free and independent and we will be in spite of the dishonorableness of the colonists. And our independence will be guaranteed by the point of our bayonets. He asked furthermore, what link could still exist between the master and the slave who has broken his chains? We can only wonder then how Haiti's economic situation might be different today if the king had remained in power and continued to oppose any indemnity, inadmissible, inadmissible. Nevertheless, the aftermath of Haiti's revolution to me firmly illustrates that in many respects, the country's war against slavery did not end when Haitians became free. Um, and it is for this reason that I think it's so important to continue to tell the story. And on this fat final slide, I just have some of the cultural artifacts that could help us. We have a play by May Miller called Christoph's Daughters for those who are more interested in palace intrigues. Mupana has this dress from the era. You can definitely see it's in the Regency style. A contemporary Dominican artist named Farley Barrias has, has been inspired by the life of Queen Marie Louise. And she spent her final days in exile in Italy. Um, and this is these are images from an article written by Le Le Grace Benson called A Queen in Diaspora, the Sorrowful Exile of Queen Molly Louise. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward um, to taking your questions. Dr. Dow, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. It was really thrilling. And I know all of the people who are in the audience tonight really very much enjoyed it. Um, we do not as of yet have any questions from the audience. So if you guys would like to quickly type some and I will gladly lay those to Dr. Doubt. I do want to tell you all that while the uh, Haitian Masterworks exhibition has closed, we do have uh, many works of Haitian art on view from our permanent collection and our permanent galleries still. So if you're inspired by tonight's talk, as I hope you are, all are, I encourage you very much to come and visit us soon. Um, let me see if there's any questions yet. I don't see any. I think everyone is still in awe of how, uh, how much information was in that and how great it was, Dr. Doubt. So thank you again. Um, I would say if anyone does have any questions for Dr. Doubt at, that you don't get uh, asked tonight. Oh, here we go. Uh, lots of people saying that it was wonderful. Uh, lots of people thanking you. Um, if you do have any questions for Dr. Doubt or uh, about Haitian art or anything, please do uh, feel free to email us here at the Figgy and we'll be glad to relay those questions. Um, but for the moment, I'd just like to thank Dr. Doubt again and uh, I hope to all see you at the next program. So thanks everyone. Thank you everybody.